So, you know, there's, there's maybe, if we're really lucky, 100 gigatons of, of carbon there, but there's not all the extra carbon that we've emitted from fossil fuels. That carbon is not going to be reversed by land use changes. Land use changes are only going to reverse the carbon that's been emitted by those land use practices to begin with. Unless we could come up with practices that were essentially retiring more carbon than nature was by itself, and that's essentially what biochar represents. So I think we're preaching to the convergent here on biochar, um, but just to, to touch on it, uh, the, the idea with biochar is that you take a portion of biomass that um, has been created by plants using the energy of sunlight to take CO2 out of the air and build the structure of the plant through photosynthesis. So the plant's structure is all carbon that came out of the air. Pretty much none of the carbon in the plant came out of the ground. The minerals came out of the ground, the water came out of the ground, but all of the carbon in the plant structure, in the carbohydrates and the, the cellulose and lignin is all carbon out of the air. If that plant dies, all of that it rots, all that carbon goes back in the air. If the plant burns, all that carbon goes back in the air. If the plant dies in a natural cycle, pretty much all of that carbon, except for maybe a tiny fraction, is going to be back in the air within a few decades, and tropical areas within a few years. So if instead we turn that plant matter into charcoal, and we bury that in the ground, the carbon in charcoal doesn't break down through natural processes. Almost all of it becomes structure in the soil. It becomes something like a battery for minerals and water. It hangs onto these things and allows them to be released to the soil bacteria. But the carbon itself creates more of a, an apartment complex for organisms. It's not part of the food cycle. So if we make a portion of that carbon from the plants in the biochar, we can get about half the carbon that the plants took out of the air into a stable form for on the order of a thousand years. In, in a tropical country, maybe a little less, in a very cold climate, maybe a lot more, but you know, roughly a thousand years, half the carbon is the sort of headline in the years. So each time we do this, we can remove some net carbon from the atmosphere. And it also increases the fertility of the soil, particularly in poor soils, it increases drought resistance. And so you also get a little incremental benefit in that you can now grow either more biomass or biomass on places that you couldn't previously grow plants. So you can actually pull the pressure off intact forests because people don't need to chop down forests to grow food. They can grow food on previously barren land that had been pushed beyond its fertility, and, and over time you could actually increase the productivity on the planet in addition to retiring this carbon. So what Wolf and Aminette et al. did is they did the mathematics, they did the numbers looking at sustainable biomass. They looked only at agricultural residues um, and they looked at that portion of the residues that you could take out of the cycle without taking so much biomass that you damaged your agricultural cycle. And so they said, okay, if we take this very limited amount of, of biomass that's very safe, and we made biochar out of that, how much carbon could we take out of circulation? And how much energy we would get from burning the part that we don't make in the biomass? about half of its carbon in the charcoal, the other half's available for energy. And so what they found in very round numbers is that if you did this globally, you could get about one petagram a year of carbon in biochar and about another petagram a year of avoided fossil emissions. And they showed that this is more than you could get than if you just took the biomass and burned it. And it's cumulatively more because every time you do it, the biochar lets you increase the amount of net fertility you have. 
And so you bootstrap yourself into more biomass production while also retiring the carbon debris. So this was a very important paper because it's the first time we've had something really validated saying it's more valuable to do biochar than it is to do biomass energy without it. Now, if you could do CCS, if, if you were able to take gaseous carbon dioxide and pump it underground, and you could do that with biochar production, you'd only have to do half as much CCS and you'd still get more benefit. Because now instead of trying to capture all the gas from fully combusting the biomass, you're capturing half of it to pump up underground. And you're getting the bootstrapping effect of putting the carbon into the soil for bio, with biochar. So you're increasing productivity and you're capturing all the carbon if CCS would work. If in comparison you didn't do biochar and you just did CCS, you'd have to do twice as much gas as CO2 and you wouldn't get the bootstrapping effect. So it's, it's clearly better to do biochar. The other thing that that biochar has in a way that we don't even know about CCS is once you've put that carbon into a charcoal form, the, the recalcitrance of it, the, the fact that it's going to stay in the ground is increasingly well proven. This material is, is very resistant to weathering and it, it stays around in the soil. But if we go back to these numbers that we started with, <coughs> If we only had to get down to 350 parts per million and we could eliminate carbon emissions today, we'd still have 150 years of carbon removal at one gigaton a year. So this is an intergenerational project. This is like building a cathedral. We may be able to increase the amount of biochar every year. Um, one conversation I've had with Jim Aminette is, is going to coastal deserts and picking crops that will grow on saline water and irrigate the coastal desert with ocean water and grow crops there just to make biochar. And if you could actually make a very alkaline biochar, you could even dump it back in the ocean to help fight the ocean city. But you know, this is the scale of conversation that we aren't having yet uh, about what does it really look like to try and dig our way out of this hole that we've got. And almost nobody really understands that if we allowed the carbon to go to levels that people are talking about, the hole that we'd be digging would require you know, a Herculean effort beyond what we can imagine with sustainable biochar for hundreds of years to try and pull that CO2 level back down. And it's already high enough now that it's causing very severe conditions. And I heard a report talking about what had happened in, um, in Pakistan, and they were saying it was as if the country had been thrown back 30 years. And, and the premise of the report is, well, now that one flood's happened, it won't happen again, and we'll be able to dig back out. But the, the more we allow the climate to, to get out of control, the more frequently we will be hit with these droughts and floods and other events. So, biochar is essentially unique. I and mean, there are one or two other things that could work. I should have put in here um, ocean fertilization, which is one of the other ways of, of removing that carbon from the atmosphere. But the people most knowledgeable about that are talking about 750 million tons, you know, three quarters of a billion tons a year at the most optimistic end of ocean fertilization. So if we start counting up what the things are out there, um, biochar we're pretty sure can do at least a billion at the really high end, it might do several billion. Ocean fertilization probably does less than a billion. If, if we're talking a minimum of 150 billion tons and probably really a minimum of 300 billion tons, you're still talking about probably a hundred years of activity at as much as we possibly can do to try and dig our way back out of this, this situation. And biochar is a categorically different 
piece of the solution than stopping the, the carbon emissions. While we're still emitting carbon, we just count carbon one way or the other. Well, if we, if we burn this biomass instead of burning this coal, that's not fossil carbon emitted, so it's a, it's a benefit. But as soon as we stop burning the coal, as soon as we get it and start pulling that back, then we're looking for things that can actually remove the carbon from the atmosphere, and there aren't very many choices. And that's really the story that's, that's driven a lot of us into this. And it's, it's interesting to, to be here and be making char at this scale, this tiny little equipment, and you know, we're doing it in Colorado at a larger scale, but not you know, in the scale of what we're up against much larger. And we're all at the infancy of something that ultimately has to go to a huge enterprise and probably one of the main activities of humanity for our great, great, great grandchildren's lives. I think without the slides, uh, I'll leave it there um, and open it for discussion. I want to elaborate a little more. We were at the geoengineering conference. And I, one of the things I took away from that was uh, how scary and ugly the alternatives to biochar are, like atmospheric aerosol or direct solar radiation elimination and I wanted you to I wanted to encourage you to talk about like, what the other plan the real plan B well, looks I, like. It's not a very organic, it's not a very friendly solution. It's a I, I actually um, I guess I have a, a slightly different perspective on it. I, I think we are going to end up having to do absolutely everything. Because if, if we figure that at current CO2 levels, we're already driving pretty, well, at previous CO2 levels, we're already driving pretty ugly events now, and they're just starting. Right. And we've got enough CO2 already in the atmosphere, never mind the overshoot we're inevitably going to have, that we're going to drive levels that are going to push on us pretty hard. Um, I like cloud brightening better than sulfur, but there may be reasons why you want to do both. The problem is that if you don't do something about the CO2 level, if you don't do biochar, if you don't do ocean fur, if you don't do all these things, uh, you're basically stuck with these other... What we're talking about are methods of reflecting more sunlight from the Earth so that you don't allow the, um, the warming to take off out of control. Um, we're already failing to form ice in the Arctic. And if we don't do something about that, that sets off a feedback loop that, that dwarfs human activity. And so the only thing we can probably do about that is see clouds to increase cloud cover so that we would cool things, so that we'd form ice again, and so on. There's, there's two methods of trying to increase reflectivity. The other one is putting sulfur in the air. A lot of people rightfully are very frightened of this. Um, you can make the case that it mimics what happens after a volcanic eruption. Just, that's where they got the idea. But the point is that we are already into probably a brave new world that very few people understand, where the impacts of what we've set in motion are so severe that we are going to be trying pretty heroic things to try and, and keep them from, from running out of control, and that of all the things that, that we're going to need to do, biochar is by far the most benign and generally friendly thing you can possibly do. It, it increases our ability to grow food. It, it allows us to reduce inputs of, of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, the other thing I didn't touch on is it, it may very well allow us to cut um, nitrous oxide emissions tremendously. And, Nitrous oxide is a huge climate forcer that's not even really being counted in negotiations yet. And if we can cut down on the amount of it being emitted, it would be a big, a big win. Um, if if truck can really do that, it might actually mean that, that climate value alone